Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, dear ministers, members of parliament, Monsieur le Président, dear Rob, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, thank you very much for this opportunity and I have to say that I do admire Nexus Institute, what you do and how much you delivered such strong messages, not just for Europe, but for humanity I'm and sorry. our common values. Hello. I think we lost something. Where is French democracy? Where did we lost it? Where did we lost it? I can, I can answer this question if you, if you give me some time. You have millions of people in the streets. Conventions of climate has been put aside. What can you say when you talk about Europe? Do you we allow me to answer? For the President of the Republic of France, Mr. Emmanuel Macron, we are here to show love on this day. But you want me? So, uh, there are places where you can have violence. This is exactly places where these type of expressions are forbidden. And this is why, and this is why I do believe it's very important to have social debate. I don't know, and I can answer all the questions you have on uh, what we are discussing in France, the law we are passing, and how this is a democracy. And uh, a democracy is exactly a place where you can demonstrate, you can have, as in your country, this type of interventions. But as in the world, we are places where democracy doesn't exist, we should not compare precisely the two situations. We can disagree, but what should accompany democracy? Because you vote and you elect people. And people elected vote for laws and they have to respect constitutions. And these constitutions were voted by people. But the counterpart is that you need respect and this is the end of violence. The day you consider that when I disagree with the law which is passed or the people who are elected, I can do whatever I want because I am the one to decide for the legitimacy of what I do, you put democracy at risk. From Capitol Hill to Brasilia to all the types of uh, happening, I would say. This is the main difference I do between a dictature, an autocracy, and a democracy. This is just a remark I wanted to make. And obviously I can revert into questions on everything that was mentioned, from climate to the pension reform in France and so on, but I wanted to take, indeed, the opportunity of the speech and what you offered to me, and uh, to discuss about our Europe and much more to discuss about our European sovereignty. And I think this concept is extremely important, especially in this time, because a little bit more than one year ago, Russia unleashed a barbaric war against Ukraine and opened probably one of the most perilous time of our European Union. Our Union is said to grow stronger through crisis, but never had we faced such a threat. A war involving nuclear power at our borders and an unsinkable event that jeopardized lasting peace 
and brought violent conflict back to the European continent. Since our European summit in Versailles, a few weeks after the beginning of the war, during the French presidency, it was in March last year, Europe stepped forward and responded swiftly and efficiently, and has continued to do since. And both pandemic and war were a big accelerator of this European sovereignty. And this is what I wanted to advocate, and I wanted perhaps to elaborate a little bit on this concept, and what it means today, and what it should mean, in the very context we, we, we know. European sovereignty could seem as a strange word. For years, this concept may have sounded like a French fantasy, or perhaps like European wishful thinking. I have to say, when I delivered a speech in La Sorbonne, September 17, a lot of comments were about, okay, European sovereignty, this is a French idea, this is just a speech. It will never happen. But I've decided to make this word central to my political projects, and I've never forgotten that the very concept of sovereignty has as well its roots in the Netherlands. And this is a very European concept. 350 years ago, right here in the city of um, The Hague, one of the founders of political modernity, Baruch Spinoza, wrote in an article 17, chapter 2 of his Tractatus Politicus, I quote him, the right is defined by the power of the multitude, we call it sovereignty. I will not lecture you on Spinoza, I want to reassure you. I just want to highlight that in Spinoza's philosophy, sovereignty is a means to guarantee the essence of being, to persevere in oneself. To put it plainly, whoever wants to be themselves must be sovereign. In other words, and I want to insist on that, identity and sovereignty are intertwined. And I think this is very important to understand this link and the fact that Spinoza makes it as one of the founding concepts of precisely political philosophy. Because if you accept to lose your sovereignty, it means if you accept to depend on other powers, you put yourself in a situation not to decide for yourself and not to be in charge of precisely continuing, preserving, developing your own identity. See, the defending sovereignty doesn't mean to shy away from our allies. It means that we must be able to choose our partners and shape our own destiny, rather than being, I would say, a mere witness of the dramatic evolution of this world. This means that we must strive to be rule makers rather than rule takers. And this we can do in a cooperative manner, in keeping with uh, our spirit of openness and partnership. But I think the wake-up call was made during the pandemic. We discovered that we were dependent on a lot of devices, on a lot of drugs, on a lot of products, suddenly. And even those who were supposed to cooperate with us, some allies, decided to ban the export during months, as long as they were not served and protected. And during the war, those who decided to cooperate, to make trade with neighbors, even if they were not allies, Russia, for energy. Because we decided, de facto, that trade could be the best way to cooperate, could create irreversible links and precisely avoid the others to be aggressive. They decided to weaponize the energy, putting us in a completely crazy and unbelievable situation. Pandemic and war just pushed us in a situation to discover that we have to reduce our dependencies if you want to preserve the European identity. Otherwise, we will progressively be dependent on everything. And it's probably due to the fact, this is a sort of convergence with what I heard, Europe was, and especially the European Union, was too much driven by a customer approach and not sufficiently by the citizen and the producer approach. And we didn't build sufficiently how to ensure our, I would say, economic security. 
And my intention, what I want to advocate, is not to, in a certain way, revert to protectionism and so on. It doesn't make sense. But to try to design with you and to define in a few minutes what could be this comprehensive economic security doctrine for the e European Union to guide our European action globally. And I mean to protect ourselves, our identity, and to put ourselves in a situation to define our current and our future model for ourselves. And for me, this new doctrine should be based on five pillars. The first one is very well known, but I want to uh, insist on that. This is, I would say, the native one of our European Union. This is competitiveness and a stronger and a better European integration. This is the first pillar, and this is very important, because you cannot be a strong role model, you cannot promote your identity, you cannot defend on the long run the European model if you are not competitive and you don't put yourself in a situation to be the one to produce the best-in-class solutions. This is why competitiveness is requested, and this is why you have to pass reforms, referring to what happened at the beginning of our discussions. Indeed, for instance, uh, just an anecdote to illustrate. You cannot live in a continent if you decide not to be competitive at a country basis and you just leave competitiveness to the others. You kill your economy, but you put the whole continent in a situation not to be competitive and in a certain way not to produce any more in your place. How to produce aircrafts, cars, but even software or anything else if you are not competitive? The customers you are will refuse to buy at such a high price. Purchasing power is a debate everywhere. You want to buy it at a fair price. If you want to buy it at a fair price and produce it in Europe, you have to be competitive to do so. I.e. passing the reforms, being sure that you innovate, you have good labor laws, protecting your people and their rights, but creating sufficient flexibility to be competitive in an open world. This balance has to be found. France was no more balanced. I have to be very honest, five years ago, six years ago. We decreased by more than two points our unemployment rates, thanks to the reform we passed. And we are passing a reform for pension. I don't, I'm not sure everybody is completely aware of that, but because uh, uh, today this reform is quite complex, but we have special regimes for some categories which is on which is not justified, so we have to stop with that. Because we are indebted and we have current deficits largely beyond your current deficit in Netherlands, and I'm not sure that the taxpayer in Netherlands will accept that we will finance a long-run social model in France with European taxpayer money, so I will have to do the job at home. And I will pass from 62 to 64. When I compare, they should be less angry with me. Because in your country it's much higher, and in a lot of countries in Europe it's much higher than 64 years old. So, matter of fact, but competitiveness and reforms being with this notion are absolutely essential if we want to stay as a continent of producer, and if we want to have the ability to decide for ourselves, i.e. to produce for ourselves. At the same time, we have now to insist on simplification and streamlining our regulation, which is absolutely key for this agenda. And we have to do much more on education, higher education and training. Because what is key for production is a very in innovative word, is to have talents, skills, and to be sure that you train your people, being your native citizens or people coming from migration, to have the right skills for this current environment. And this policy is absolutely critical if you want to be sovereign and if you, you want to have this comprehensive economic security doctrine. But at the same time of this reform and competitiveness agenda, you need more Europe and more integration. We have to go further and much further. We have to integrate our markets. Why? Because this is the best way to have strong players. When you create a startup 
in one of our, of, of our countries, we have to deal with 27 regulations in a lot of sectors. When you do it in China or in the US, because this is where the competition is at stake, your domestic market is much bigger. The chance, the strength of Europe is our single market, and it's how to better integrate the single market on digital, on industry, and so on. And how, as well, to make it in common through discussions, sometimes controversies, and this unique myotic of our regulation in Europe, but building a common approach. It's even more essential on the financing of our economy, and I want to insist on that. The financing of our economy is, it will, is and will be more and more critical in an innovative world because you need talents and capital. And today we are not properly equipped. We still have, we have a very good European regulation. We did a lot post-financial crisis, but we are still very fragmented and we don't have a proper capital market union. And we need it. Why? Because you have a lot of savings in a lot of rich countries, but these savings are not properly allocated. They have to go to very innovative SMEs and to poor or middle-income countries in our Europe. If you want the savings to be allocated on the right risk and the right places where you have opportunities and returns, you need a capital market unions to be integrated. This is not the case today. Our savings are in very rich places, but they don't circulate and they are not properly allocated, which is for our competitiveness and uh, our futures, I think, a weakness. So here is the first pillar of our economic doctrine, competitiveness and better European integration. This is a necessity in this economy and this environment where we are at stake. The second pillar is having industrial policies. A very long time it was a taboo in Europe because the first pillar was sufficient. During decades, the first pillar I mentioned was the alpha and omega of our economic policies. Having industrial policy was forbidden because it was an intervention on the market to decide something, to interfere, to create bias and so on. But we need it. Why? Because our competitors today are interfering in the market, matter of fact. And because we have to accelerate and because we put ourselves in a situation to be too much dependent because of the unbalance between market and public intervention in Europe. Let me express with, by taking one example. If you don't have industrial policy, you cannot create progressively your autonomy or at least your de-risking on energy. This is impossible. If you don't have, don't have a political uh, an interference, I would say, or an intervention of uh, um, uh, uh, industrial policy, you cannot create your own net zero industry. You can not create or strengthen your own chips industry because the other powers are interfering on that and they have an industrial policy. And you cannot, you cannot be the only lasting piece of this world with a market without industrial policy. The US has one and strengthen it. China has one. We need a European one. It doesn't mean to become a autarcic in this world. But it's how to be, to have more autonomy or to better diversify your dependencies, to be sure that you are not trapped in a crazy situation the day something wrong will happen. So having additional policies will, is and will be critical in several fields. And I want to um, just insist on this one. One, energy. During the past year, we made a wonderful collective job. We diversified our gas furniture. We were over-dependent on Russia. We diversified through our market interventions, finding new producers on gas. But what we will have to do is to build a new strategy where we will have progressively to reduce 
our dependencies and build more sovereignty on energy. Which means that you can reconcile climate, and I totally agree, sovereignty and industry by creating your own energy through basically less consumption and more energy efficiency and innovation, European innovation, but more renewables on the European soil and more nuclear energy on the European soil. This is clearly an industrial policy we are putting in place and we have to put in place because you have to put subsidies at the federal and national level to increase and accelerate these policies and you have to find the right incentives to do so. Otherwise, everybody will be driven by short-term incentives and not take into consideration some singles and price. You want them to take into consideration your independence, sovereignty, and climate change. This is an industrial policy where you have to gather industry, climate, and sovereignty. Second, all the energies, the technologies, and so on, you need for, I mean, in order to deal with climate change. We will fix climate change with a lot of regulations, and I know that your country is, uh, I mean, knows very well what can happen when you, p you put people and you progressively ask them to make a change through regulation when you have to do so. This is our agenda. This is what you, we decided for ourselves at the European scale. But we can do it as well if we produce the solutions on our, on our soil. And this is critical if we want to reconcile climate change, industry, and creating economic value on our soil, and financing our social model, because there is no justice if there is no more production. If you don't produce money, you have no debate on how to share this money. And this is a big risk. If we rush for climate change, if we promote solutions we will buy, and if we don't produce these solutions. And this is exactly what's at stake today in the current environment. This is why we need industrial policy in Europe for net zero industry. And this is exactly the document issued by the European Commission a few days ago to promote this net zero industrial act, which is very important. This is how to accept some subsidies, some stated a current environmental, a current, sorry, regulatory framework, but to be sure that we will produce and attract a maximum of innovations and new industries helping us to deal with carbon neutrality. This is critical. Otherwise, we will lose our sovereignty and our ability to decide. We will fit with the requirements. We will become a neutral for 2050. But with Chinese or American technologies, which will put us at risk and, and create a huge turmoil because it will kill jobs and it will create a situation where we will not be in a situation to decide for ourselves. It's obviously the same on defense, where we need a common industry. And we have to, to streamline our organization, and we need this approach. And from the CHIPS Act, boosting R&D and producing much more on this critical field, to the Net Zero Industry Act, and so on, this second pillar of precisely an industrial policy in our Europe is absolutely key. As I don't want to be too long, I would say that it's exactly the same. We have to bear in mind for all the pillars where we don't want to be too much dependent. We want to be open, we want allies, we want good friends, we want partners. But we always want to be in a situation to choose them, not to be 100% dependent on them. And this is exactly the same on agriculture. We have to make a lot of changes to make our agriculture and food model compatible with climate change. But if the result of our policy is to import more and more products coming from countries less restrictive than we are or less demanding than we are, this is a failure at the end. So we have, we, we do need an industrial policy for our, our agriculture, precisely to produce here with our rules, but to help our producers to do more. And this is why we did advocate at the European scale a protein plan to be less dependent on protein and to produce more on our continent. The third pillar of this strategy, according to me, is protection. 
protection of our interests. This is, I would say, the defensive side of this offensive uh, strategy I mentioned with industrial policy. Indeed, we have to accept to protect vital interests and strategic assets when we consider they could be put at risk. When you have hostile action or distortive actions or practices. And I think this is very important. Based on security and public order criteria, the EU has, for the first time, equipped itself with a tool allowing to block or ban holdings of foreign acquisitions in strategic companies. What we decided through this regulation is a complete ideological change. Till very recently, we just considered we were open without any conditions. We recognize, for good reasons, that we need a screening of these foreign investments on some critical assets. We did exactly the opposite, by the way, during and after the financial crisis, when we pushed some member states to fire sales, selling critical assets, for instance, to Chinese interests. I mean, energy companies, ports, and so on. We decided to do now something very different. So on cyber infrastructure, uh, critical infrastructure, cyber security, everywhere we consider we have vulnerabilities or national and European security at risk, we are entitled to have this, pro this protection mechanism to be activated and precisely to have this preventive side. This is the same on a lot of other issues from defense to technologies and so on, and I think it's very important. And according to me, this is exactly how and why we have to follow up on, on the digital side regarding content, speaking about education and culture. We just, we were driven by free speech. I do defend and I do advocate this notion and I'm, I'm a big defender of this free speech approach and, and, and freedom of content because it's part of the European model. But let's be clear, when you're open without any regulation to protect yourself in this content, you expose yourself to propaganda coming from outside. You expose yourself to algorithm decided elsewhere. And you put your children, your people, sometimes your democracy at risk. Because it can be manipulated by other interests and by people deciding for yourself. And this is why we have now a new continent on this protective side, which is how we want to protect the content of our social medias, our artificial intelligence, on all these innovations where, I mean, we are exposed to, and which can interfere in the education of our children or the functioning of our democracy. We have to be very smart, sophisticated, coordinated, and we need a common approach. We started to do so with the famous directive DSA. We started to regulate the content. But we will have to go further, we know that, just to protect our model and our European model. And not to be in the hands of non-European private interests or non-European government interests. And I think this prevention pillar and this protection pillar is very important. The so fourth pillar of um, our doctrine, according to me, would be reciprocity. And it would constitute in the context of a more transactional and mutually beneficial approach, a very important circle of action of the EU. I know that the reciprocity dimension, which is certainly the most demanding at EU level, is sometimes difficult to admit. But I also observe that mindsets have gradually evolved in this area as well. I took, um, almost 10 years for the, it took almost 10 years for the EU to adopt the international procurement instrument just to ensure reciprocity in public procurement. Why? Because the European approach is always a, a sort of complex intrication of, an ad, of addition of national interests. And sometimes the offensive points of some countries doesn't meet with the defensive points of the other countries. And the result is that we wanted the market to do the job. We need reciprocity. 
And I want uh, to insist on the fact that reciprocity will be core, especially for the new generation of trade agreement. We will have all this debate, we know that, on Mercosur and some other trade agreements. This is very well known and it will be everywhere in your press and my press and our parliaments. I'm, I do believe in openness. I think that trade was very beneficial for the Europeans and very beneficial for most of the places of this world. And one of the best ways to uh, fight against poverty. But you need a fair trade and reciprocity is part of it. And the free trade agreement must now to obey a, ration, a, a rational which goes beyond the purely economic logic. And I want to insist on at least three points. First, sustainability. It's, it's simply impossible to conceive that our EU trade policy might not be fully sustainable. We should stop signing and accepting trade agreements with governments and people which don't respect Paris Agreement and our biodiversity commitments. Otherwise, we put ourselves to over or at least constrain our producers following our requirements and our commitments, but we will accept to import products coming from places less demanding and not compliant with Paris Agreement and biodiversity agreements. This is a double whammy approach because you will help them basically not to respect what you believe in, you will kill your industry and you're important top of that. So let's stop that and uh, at this regard, the EU New Zealand agreement established a sort of gold standard in this area and should definitely be present in all future trade agreements, which means that you need as an essential clause, not as, I would say just a confetti or something nice and the, and the cake, not the cherry and the cake. An essential clause of your trade agreement should be the respect of climate change and biodiversity commitments. Second, it's fairness and a balance in concessions to avoid any detrimental effects of the EU, on the EU economy, especially regarding the most sensitive sectors. And third, to clear strategic interests of, of the agreement for the EU. How would we, the agreement provide privileged access to critical raw material, for example? How would it contribute effectively to diversifying, de diversifying EU supplies in key sectors and so on? But besides that, what we need definitely is a mirror mechanism and mirror measures to be sure that when you put constraints on your producers, you ask the same to the producers coming from the country you are signing with. This is the only way to make this trade agreement sustainable and acceptable for your people and your industry. My last pillar and my last point about this doctrine is regarding cooperation. We have to push, promote our agenda through a series of cooperation in order to strengthen and extend our multilateral rules and instruments and precisely to do more together and, and push this European model uh, internationally. First uh, of this cooperation, we have to be the one to revitalize and extend the multilateral framework. WTO is no more functioning. We need it. So we have to promote and re-promote this agenda with the US and some others. But, um, an agreement was found on the fight against illegal fishing in June 2022. The new head of um, the new chairman of WTO is making a wonderful job. We have to help her to resume the very important agenda we had precisely in order to fix conflicts and to have clear mechanism in case of conflict. This is one of the best ways to be uh, an open world more sustainable. Second, we have to ensure compliance by third countries with high standard of values. To this end, we have a very powerful tool, our single market as mentioned, but the external part of the single market. And the transformation of the EU has been very swift in this area too. It now makes uh, use all of its policies well beyond the single channel of trade policy. We have started working in this direction. The instruments, for instance, to fight deforestation 
will, for instance, help tackle imported raw materials and processed products of which the production contributes directly or indirectly to deforestation, i.e., if we create a sort of condition of access to our single market sometimes, the fact that you cooperate on an agenda you find as essential, you are much more efficient. With regard to respect of fundamental rights, we know how much important this is, and this is exactly what we are promoting on due diligence, forced labor, and so on, and this is very important. I think this cooperative approach should be the one we use as well, working all together to team up all the European, I mean, the European Union, its member states, the development agencies, European Investment Bank, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, playing together and promoting precisely our agenda our interests and our values with third country. But this cooperation is absolutely key with third countries if we want to be more efficient. This is exactly the same approach we want to promote for our development model in the June summit we will organize, having all the Europeans working together to set up a new standard. As you can see, with these five pillars, competitiveness and single market, industrial policy, protection, reciprocity, and cooperation, we can set up a new economic doctrine which will allow us to reconcile creating jobs, financing our social model, dealing with climate change, and being more sovereign and deciding for ourselves. And I think this is critical. This is critical in this period of time where we have war, and economy is being weaponized. And everything in our economy will be progressively part of national security. And I think this is critical if we want to preserve our open model, to remain open and base our approach on this uh, capital market model. But if we don't want to depend on the other ones, and if we want to preserve our values, and our European model, which is based on humanism and attachment to freedom and solidarity. Here at Nexus, 20 years ago, George Steiner gave an important speech about the idea of Europe. And he said, Europe is made up of cafes. This extends from Pecho's favorite cafe in Lisbon to the Odessa cafes haunted by Isaac Babel's gangsters. And I fully believe I very often mention this moment of Steiner, and I fully believe in the spirit of cafe. As Steiner said, which thrives in our great continent, from Lisbon to Odessa, because cafe are closed where people are bombed. And cafe was a place where you can have controversies, discussions, you can share disagreements, but at the very end, you dream. Our Europe is made of dreams, but actual dreamers are very pragmatic. Otherwise, they finish with the dreams of the others. I'm a dreamer and idealistic, but I don't want my dreams to be dreamt in other people's language. I want our music to be the one to be played everywhere, dear Jordi. I want our literature to be precisely this permanent discussion between the different capitals of our continent, with one of the characteristics is precisely to have so many languages and to be in a certain way driven by this permanent translation. I want our model of complexity, unity through respect, and diversity to be the one to be preserved. This is why we have to reset this economic doctrine. This is why European sovereignty is not just a concept or a fantasy, but it's absolutely, in a dangerous world, a necessity to live, dream for ourselves as Europeans. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the President will have around 50 minutes. To... Really? Okay. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Um, to take questions, um, let us first go to some people uh, uh, over there who were patiently sitting uh, over there. And in the meantime, they did a lot of uh, thinking. Um, Aram, may I? Hello, President Macron. My name is Aram, and I have a question for you. The rise of nationalism poses a challenge to the foundations of the European project. How do you... What is your vision regarding fostering a shared European identity that embraces our diverse cultural heritage while also addressing the underlying concerns and grievances that drive national sentiments to prevent the resurgence of old conflicts? Thank you, thank you very much. I will try to address both of you. Uh, um, look, I think the, the national feeling is totally compatible with the European idea. Being a patriot is completely compatible with being European, and I, I pretend to be both at the same time. Nationalism is different because you like your culture, your country, and so on, but you consider that liking him makes you an opponent to your neighbor and other Europeans. And this is why nationalism leads to war. And this is exactly why we decided to build this European Union and this European idea. To say we respect each other, we are different. But we do consider that the drama of our continent is in a civil war of the Europeans. And we want to defend our national culture, but we want to build the European one, which is the result of this permanent discussion. And we want to go beyond these differences. Today we have a resume of uh, these national feelings. Why? Because we live in this very hectic, complex and times, and they are increasing anxiety. When you have anxiety, you have fears. And if you don't provide reasonable solutions for these fears, the normal reaction is that you decide to retrench on yourselves. This is your personal reaction. And this is a reaction of the different nations themselves. This is a world of anxiety, so I, I want a solution for myself. I, this is a sort of distrust of the others. I want to advocate exactly the opposite. I think on all the key challenges we have, climate change, digital change, war, and all this issue, we are much stronger together. Europe is an asset. The problem is that Europe sometimes is leading some key changes and seen as a sort of constraining power. This is quite unfair because this is always a result of the discussions and the decisions of 27 member states. But very often national leaders or local leaders have this, I would say, behavior to say, I'm sorry, I would have done differently, but this is Europe to decide. We are the Europe, the 27 capitals. Because if you want to block something, you can block something at 27, in fact. And it happened during the past few years. So this is our responsibility and we should not make the European burden bigger. Sometimes, as Europeans, we can make mistakes. And when we picture ourselves, Europe, as a sort of process of harmonization and uniformization, it increases this feeling of anxiety because people have the feeling to lose their identity. So we have to be very careful with that. So my answer is being a patriot and a European is compatible. In these times, we have to convince in order to fight against the nationalistic and extremist movement that Europe is an asset and one of the best ways to deal with your fears. Third, we have to be careful as Europeans not to be too much on the lecturing side and uh, uniformity side. Being European is being so many 
nationalities and histories together. So this is unity with diversity. Thank you. Aida, where are you? Here you are. Aida. Um, yeah, uh, hello, my name is Aida, I stutter, please know that. Uh, before I, I uh, ask my questions, thank you, firstly, uh, to helping my community, the, the, the Yazidis. Uh, it's very important uh, to state that. And my question, uh, yeah, they're related to each other. Um, do you think there is a neurological explanation um, why do we see do what we see in the world, uh, why uh, do people calling them themselves leaders in whatever title they have harm their people and just wake up and like it's nothing? Uh, and uh, yeah, the, 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 what uh, do, do you think a new age uh, yeah, the, 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 the leadership uh, needs? Um, and how ca can you help to put it to pioneer um, in the, the pioneer or, or the role uh, when it comes uh, a new to the leadership? And um, um, because uh, we need so, so the, the, the societies that are the, the, the rooted in health, uh, the, the, the well-being, and you the, 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 the mentioned uh, the, the sustainability, uh, we need that. And uh, the, the, let's not, the, not make uh, the, the, the historical uh, the fault to, to think that, 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 that humanity is about technology only. It's about humans. Uh, look, as for your first question, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not sure I have a, um, a proper answer. I'm not the best, the best expert of this type of, uh, of leaders, even if I try to convince some with very poor delivery uh, 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 years ago. But it's clear that we have in this world some leaders sometimes taking irreversible decisions. I, I'm not sure that the explanation is a neurological one. This is a systematic one, and a systemic one. When you are in super-centric and non-democratic systems, you have less regulation. And you can put one or very few people to decide crazy things without regulation and counterpowers. So this is why our democracies, with the regular elections and alternance, counterpowers and so on, I think are better equipped in this complex environment not to put our world in a crazy situation and to wake up the day after. Because when, when you are in such a system, you have no more, I would say, feeling to be guilty or something like that. You are in a different position. So this is my, my, my number one explanation. Second, in, in terms of leadership and the one we need, I, I will take your final remark. I totally agree with you. What I try to advocate for our doctrine and our economic doctrine is to be sure that we put this doctrine at the service of the European model. The European model is based on humanism, which, by the way, is one of the link between our two countries from Erasmus to uh, Montaigne and, uh, and the Enlightenment. Uh, Europe was made by, by these people, these thinkers, these artists, thinking that nothing was beyond human dignity. And the difference with some of the places of this world is that, and especially authoritarian regime, is that nothing is beyond either the, the group, the collective, I mean, the nation or the power itself. This is not our approach. And if you put human dignity at the top, you have to create the leadership and the, I would say, the current, the common organization which will allow you to do so, i.e. the political systems which check and balances in order to do so and preserve this human dignity. But second, you have to put yourself in a situation, it was my, my, my speech, but not to depend on the others whose choices are totally different. 
So human dignity at the top, but being strong at the service of this philosophy. Otherwise, you can put human dignity and your values at the top. If de facto, when we go to technology on the other skill or defense and so on, you depend on those you disagree with or you don't like values, you will have no more choices. This is why sovereignty is so important. Uh, where is letter? I got a question of letter. No, she's, she's there? Okay. Um, can you give her the microphone? Um, thank you for your speech. Um, I just graduated from my study economics, and I also heard a lot of that um, back in your speech. And you know, it's a rational way of thinking. Uh, but I graduated in behavioral economics, and I know that people and countries do not always behave very rational. And I was wondering, um, for that reason, um, the economy itself is not always a sufficient clue, you know, to keep the European, uh, to keep Europe together, you know, then we would not have had the Brexit, for example. Um, but if it's not the money and the economies, what does work as a good clue for Europe and keep, can keep uh, the European countries together? I totally agree with you. Uh, first, I think it's history and culture. And when you, when, when you look at our own history and how the European Union was made and where, why we decided to do so, it's after the Second World War, big drama. I mean, we almost killed ourselves because of, uh, during the Second World War. And I think this generation, the generation of our founding fathers, had, I take your own formula, but this glue, which was never ever. I don't want to see that again. And they were sure that we had something to do together because our humanism, our very special relationship with freedom and at the same time our social model which is quite unique balance, was something they wanted to preserve. And they decided to put together steel and coal. What we needed to fight against each other during the, the past decades. So they said, in order to be sure, let's merge on that. And, and economy and industry was, was not the purpose and the actual glue. It was just a tool because we wanted to be sure of that. So I would say the first answer is about history, culture, feelings, emotions. The second is about, I mean, precisely politics, controversies, permanent discussions, because we have this culture and this, uh, this common history. And this is for me, by nature, I consider it as more important than economy. But I think we are entering in, in these times where geopolitics precisely will prob probably frame and decide on geoeconomics. This is a very new moment. And beyond that, and this is what makes us common, our values. We are a continent of, of common values. And even before our European Union, we have the, con the Council of Europe and a common charter, and we decided to, to put as a com in a common constitution these values. And we fight for that. We fought for that and we still fight for that. This is a much more efficient way to remain together. Economy, for me, is at the service of this project. As long as it provides opportunities and progress for your middle classes. But this is another debate. Um. You've been listening there to the French president, Emmanuel Macron, giving a speech and taking some questions on the issue of the future of Europe. At the beginning, he was interrupted by hecklers who accused him of undermining French democracy. But when his speech did get underway, though, Macron focused on his vision for the continent in the coming decades.